The Pacific Northwest has been sitting on a ticking time bomb for centuries. Beneath the beautiful landscapes and bustling cities lies the Cascadia Subduction Zone, a fault line that spans from Northern California to British Columbia. This fault has the potential to unleash a massive earthquake, far more powerful than anything the region has experienced before. Unlike the more familiar San Andreas Fault, the Cascadia Subduction Zone can produce earthquakes of magnitude 9.0 or higher. Scientists warn that the pressure between the Juan de Fuca and North American plates is building, and when it finally gives way, the results will be catastrophic. So, in today's video, we'll dive into the science behind this looming threat, the impact it could have on the Pacific Northwest, and how to prepare for the inevitable. Without further ado, let's get into it. The Cascadia Subduction Zone The Cascadia Subduction Zone is a massive fault line that runs from Northern California through Oregon and Washington all the way to British Columbia. It lies 50 to 100 miles offshore and stretches for about 620 miles. This is where the Juan de Fuca Plate is being forced under the North American Plate. This slow collision, at a rate of about an inch and a half per year, builds up immense pressure over centuries. The plates don't slide past each other smoothly. Instead, they lock together, creating a tremendous amount of stress. When this stress is finally released, it results in a massive earthquake. For this reason, the Cascadia Subduction Zone is capable of producing earthquakes greater than magnitude 9.0. These mega-thrust earthquakes happen when the entire locked section of the fault ruptures, releasing centuries of accumulated energy in minutes. One of the most significant historical earthquakes in this zone occurred on January 26, 1700. This megathrust earthquake had an estimated magnitude between 8.7 and 9.2. It caused the coastline to drop and triggered a huge tsunami that reached Japan, recorded there as the Orphan Tsunami. Geological evidence of the 1700 earthquake has been found along the Pacific Northwest coast in the form of ghost forests and tsunami deposits. Ghost forests are created when coastal land suddenly subsides during an earthquake, causing seawater to inundate and kill trees, leaving behind their preserved stumps. Additionally, layers of sand and other sediments deposited by the tsunami can still be seen in coastal marshes and estuaries. This 1700 earthquake serves as a powerful reminder of what the Cascadia subduction zone is capable of. Modern research shows that these massive earthquakes happen roughly every 300 to 500 years. And since it's been over 320 years since the last one, scientists are increasingly concerned about the next big quake. In recent years, efforts to understand and prepare for the next Cascadia earthquake have intensified. Researchers are now using geological studies, computer models, and historical data to predict impacts and develop strategies to mitigate damage. Having seen the hidden might of Cascadia, let's contrast it with California's infamous San Andreas Fault to understand the true scale of threat looming over the Pacific Northwest. Comparison of the Cascadia Subduction Zone to the more famous San Andreas Fault Now, when comparing the Cascadia Subduction Zone to the more famous San Andreas Fault, you find that they are very different. Their characteristics and potential impacts are worlds apart. The San Andreas Fault, stretching about 800 miles through California, is a strike-slip fault where two tectonic plates slide past each other horizontally. On the other hand, the Cascadia Subduction Zone is a megathrust fault, where one plate is forced beneath another, leading to more complex and potentially more destructive interactions. The San Andreas Fault is known for frequent but generally moderate earthquakes, with a maximum magnitude of around 8.2. This horizontal movement limits the stress that can build up and be released. In contrast, the Cascadia Subduction Zone can produce far more powerful earthquakes. The vertical displacement involved in subduction allows for a significant buildup of stress, resulting in potential earthquakes exceeding magnitude 9.0. This means that while the San Andreas Fault might shake more often, the Cascadia Subduction Zone can cause much more catastrophic events. The difference in potential impact is stark. Earthquakes are measured on a logarithmic scale, where each whole number increase represents a tenfold increase in amplitude and about 31.6 times more energy release. For instance, an earthquake with a magnitude of 9.0 releases over 31 times more energy than an 8.0 and about 1,000 times more energy than a 7.0. 
This illustrates just how powerful earthquakes from the Cascadia subduction zone can be compared to those from the San Andreas Fault. The duration of shaking also varies greatly with magnitude. A typical magnitude 6.0 earthquake might only last a few seconds to 10 seconds. A magnitude 7.0 about 15 to 30 seconds and a magnitude 8.0 around 1 to 2 minutes. However, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake like the one possible in the Cascadia subduction zone could cause violent shaking for four minutes or longer. This prolonged shaking would lead to extensive structural damage, overwhelming emergency response capabilities, and severely impacting the region. The impact of a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake is worsened by the region's current state of preparedness. While California has extensively studied and reinforced the infrastructure along the San Andreas Fault, the Pacific Northwest has lagged behind. Many buildings, bridges, and other critical infrastructure in Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia were built before modern seismic codes and are at significant risk of collapse or severe damage during a major earthquake. With such colossal forces at play, what happens when the inevitable finally strikes? Immediate effects of the earthquake. Now, when a massive earthquake hits the Cascadia subduction zone, the impact will be immediate and devastating. It will start with a compression wave, which will travel faster than the actual shaking. This wave is usually imperceptible to humans, but often causes noticeable reactions in animals, especially dogs, which may start barking or showing signs of distress. Early warning systems will detect these initial compression waves, giving people crucial seconds to prepare. These systems use a network of sensors to monitor ground movements and send alerts via mobile phones, radio, and television. This can provide up to 90 seconds of lead time, allowing for quick safety measures. During this brief window, automated systems spring into action. Trains can be stopped to prevent derailments. Power plants can shut down to avoid hazardous failures. And elevators can be halted and opened to prevent entrapment. Hospitals can pause surgeries and other critical operations to protect patients and staff. This short period of warning can significantly reduce immediate dangers. As the main shaking begins, power will likely go out almost immediately, plunging entire regions into darkness. Homes, buildings, and infrastructure across the Pacific Northwest will face intense and prolonged shaking, especially near the fault line. This shaking, potentially lasting up to four minutes, will cause widespread structural damage. Many residential homes, especially older ones, are not bolted to their foundations, making them particularly vulnerable. These homes can be violently displaced, sliding off their foundations and collapsing. Inside homes, furniture and household items will become projectiles, windows will shatter, and structural components will fail. Commercial buildings and high-rises will also suffer extensive damage. Even modern structures built to current seismic codes may experience significant stress, leading to partial or total collapse in some cases. Non-structural elements such as ceilings, windows, and internal partitions will fail, creating hazardous conditions for anyone inside. Older buildings, especially those built before modern seismic standards, are at a higher risk of catastrophic failure. Infrastructure such as bridges, highways, and utilities will be severely impacted. Bridges that still need to be retrofitted to withstand seismic activity may collapse or suffer extensive damage, cutting off critical transportation routes. Highways will be disrupted with landslides and surface cracking, hindering emergency response efforts. Water, gas, and sewage lines will rupture, leading to widespread service disruptions and potential hazards like fire and flooding. Beyond the initial physical damage, communities will face secondary hazards, including fires from ruptured gas lines, hazardous material spills, and the threat of aftershocks that can cause further damage to already weakened structures. Emergency services will be overwhelmed, and communication networks may be disrupted, complicating rescue and recovery efforts. And that may not be the worst possible scenario, as the region may also be hit by a tsunami. Tsunami Aftermath After a major earthquake in the Cascadia subduction zone, a tsunami is almost inevitable. This happens because the sudden movement of the ocean floor displaces a huge volume of water, creating powerful waves. When the Juan de Fuca plate slips beneath the North American plate, it causes a vertical shift in the seafloor, triggering the tsunami. These waves travel incredibly fast, reaching speeds of 500 to 600 miles per hour in deep water. 
As they approach shallower coastal areas, they slow down but grow much taller, threatening coastal communities with immense force. People in these areas may only have 10 to 30 minutes to evacuate to higher ground. This short time frame highlights the critical need for immediate action and preparedness. The Pacific Northwest's coastline is lined with communities at high risk, including Crescent City and Eureka in California, Newport and Seaside in Oregon, and Long Beach and Ocean Shores in Washington. In British Columbia, Tofino and Yuklulet are similarly vulnerable. These coastal towns face not only the immediate danger of flooding, but also significant loss of life and property. The inundation zone includes homes, businesses, schools, and essential facilities like hospitals and emergency services. Despite regulations since 1995 preventing new essential facilities in these zones, many existing structures remain at risk. The impact of the tsunami will be devastating. Waves will flatten buildings, uproot trees, and sweep vehicles and debris far inland. Those who do not evacuate in time will face extreme danger from the fast-moving water and debris. The initial wave will often be followed by several more, each adding to the destruction. Entire neighborhoods can be demolished, leaving behind rubble and chaos. And in the immediate aftermath, these coastal communities will be unrecognizable. So, what are the mitigation efforts being followed? Preparedness and Mitigation Efforts Now, the good news is that this region has time to prepare. Scientists predict that the region may have 50 years or more before this devastating period. Efforts to prepare for a potential Cascadia subduction zone earthquake have also improved significantly, but gaps remain. Preparedness varies widely across the Pacific Northwest. Some areas have made substantial progress in strengthening their infrastructure and emergency response capabilities, while others are still catching up. Government and community initiatives have been crucial. States like Oregon and Washington have updated building codes to ensure new constructions can withstand significant seismic activity. Retrofitting older buildings and critical infrastructure such as bridges and hospitals is ongoing, although funding limitations mean progress is gradual. Early warning systems like ShakeAlert are also being installed. These systems provide seconds to minutes of advance notice before shaking from an earthquake reaches a location, allowing for automatic safety measures and public alerts. Community initiatives also play a crucial role. Some local governments and nonprofits are now educating the public about earthquake preparedness. Neighborhood programs like CERT, Community Emergency Response Teams, train volunteers to assist in emergency responses, ensuring communities have trained individuals that are ready to act during a disaster. Despite these efforts, significant gaps remain. Many buildings, especially residential homes, are still unreinforced and vulnerable. Funding for large-scale infrastructure projects is limited, leading to delays in critical upgrades. Public awareness and individual preparedness levels vary, with some residents lacking essential knowledge on how to protect themselves during and after an earthquake. So, we are still a long way from calling it safe, but there is incredible progress in making the region resilient to this catastrophic event. So, what are your thoughts on the potential impact of a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake let us know in the comments below, and remember to give this video a thumbs up if you found it informative. Make sure to subscribe to our channel for more insightful videos like this one.